Some people are still having coffee, but obviously I'm not Dan Walsh. Dan unfortunately couldn't make it here. Most of you have already seen the talk before, so I'm repeating myself, maybe. Um, if not, um, my name is Valentin. I'm working in Dan's team, so he trusted me to give the talks on his behalf. Um, I'm not sure how long this talk will take, because I never gave this, uh, this talk, and Dan didn't either, because this was the first time he planned to do it. So it's a world premiere, if you, if you want. So in, in the talks before, um, I was talking about the containers philosophy of uh, Red Hat and that Dan and his team and teams uh, ac across uh, the company were somehow reflecting on what container tools should do, how they can be built, the architecture um, they're, they're based on, and the different use cases. And we were talking a lot about uh, Podman today already, we were having a brief look at Builder, right, how we can use it, that it's meant to be a core utils library and that it still supports Dockerfile, but we extended it a little bit to uh, support include files and things like this. And this talk targets uh, Builder specifically, how we can run Builder in Kubernetes building pipelines, for instance, how we can do this in a more secure fashion, how it's meant to be used, and also how we can speed up things. In the end, we always have done, or a very common optimization problem is uh, security and performance. And the team was working a lot on optimizing this as much as possible with what the kernel can do at the moment and what the standards have to offer at the moment. So Builder, Builder I think is, I think it's around two years ago on DEF CONF, Dan asked the team to, uh, besides Portman, also create a tool that builds container images. And I'm not sure if you have met or heard Dan before, he has a very, 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 very strong Boston accent. So he said, instead of builder, he said builder. And this is how it, how it came, came to be. Um, right, there's a, a cute logo also, right, of the Boston, Boston dog. Um, and this one, uh, I think this is the old logo. The new one, uh, the head is whiter because people came to him and asked why the dog is wearing underwear on the head. <laughs> So, as I said before, Builder is specialized into building containers, uh, container images, and it's meant to go beyond what Docker files have, have to offer, right? Docker files do a great job, and I use it on a daily basis. Maybe you use it on a daily basis, but uh, there are certain needs and use cases where Docker file is too constrained, too limited, and uh, Builder is targeting targeting exactly this. So for instance, here we can, with Builder from, Builder creates a new container and starts it. Here uh, we create a new container that is based on Fedora, on Fedora latest, and Builder will return the container ID. A Builder mount mounts the root FS of this building container on the host and returns the mount point, which we're storing in the uh, MET variable. And then we can um, use the mount point and operate on it. So in a talk before, I was mentioning, uh, for instance, instead of Fedora, we can use Scratch. So it's basically an empty container. There's nothing on the root FS besides some some mounts and devices that are required to actually execute the container. And then we can use this, or we can use DNF install install root and use the host and the host repositories to install the binaries in the container. So this is really a good way to um, create a very trimmed down minimal container image. Um, Before, 
at least I think this is what Dan wanted to say with this slide, is pointing to Docker CP. So before, if you wanted to exchange data between the container and the host, you either had to use volumes, which are essentially mounts, um, or copy, uh, you could, could use network storages as well, or you copy data between the container, between containers, or host and container. Then you alter the data, data and copy it back with Podman mount, you can just have, or you have full access to the rootFS of the container and do whatever you want. And <clears throat> and the cool thing is, you don't need to write something specific. You don't need to wrap around a tool like Docker that you can use. You can basically use scripts that you already have and you execute on the host. Uh, maybe you have to crude inside it and then execute it there but it will work. It's a very transparent, transparent way of achieving it. Uh, right, here for instance we, we copy uh, or do a recursive copy from some sources into the mount point. Then we do a DNF install root. So what install root does, it changes some paths of DNF which will surface into DNF installing the HTTPD, HTTPD package under the mount point instead of uh, the uh, host paths. Uh, right here, or we can do when we're in a, in a source project, you compile, you compile your whatever, let's say Podman, and then you can change the uh, destination directory onto the mount and then it will be installed there. So it's a very, very easy and transparent and portable way of working with containers. Um, I referred to to the person in the red t-shirt in the back already a few times before, but it's just awesome that you wear it. Containers are Linux and this is, this is it. There is uh, we try hard not to make working with containers something special. It should work just as working on a VM on your host. There should be nothing, nothing special about it. And it should be easy to integrate. It should be compatible and also interoperable. And this is a, um, basically what containers are Linux can mean as well. Um, right. And uh, builder also supports the builder config command. What config does, it uh, alters or allows to alter the um, configuration of the resulting image. So here, if we do a builder config dash dash entry point, uh, and if we then commit the image, create an image from that in the configuration, we will then change the entry point to whatever we have done. We can also change environment variables. So. This is basically something that the Docker file exposes already and that we still need also when we're just working on the CLI and this is a, a neat way to, to achieve altering the config of the, the resulting image. And last but not least, we can uh, commit the uh, container. So we use the current state of the container and create a container image out of it, uh, out of it and we call it my HTTPD. And after that, we can we can push it to uh, to Dan's um, repository on the Docker I/O registry. But I'm not as entertaining as Dan. Usually, he he wants people to talk all the time. Uh, I'm not a cowboy like he is, so I just say, Dan, wait. What about Dockerfile? For sure, Builder also supports Dockerfile. Um, with the uh, build using a Docker file command, you can use it in the same way as with Docker. Or for the lazy ones, you can use build a bud, which is short for build using Docker file. And does build a have a scripting language? Perhaps build a file? It's bash. I already made the joke before, but well, the, the slides are not very old. <laughs> so, um, what do we mean by bash? Containers are Linux. We didn't want to in, uh, introduce a new concept that people have to adopt to. They can just use the tools they're used to and the scripts that are already out there in the wild. So we want to offer uh, yeah, a 
core utils like experience. So we want and encourage people to build their tools on top of Builder. Um, if they have certain needs or certain requirements or uh, specific use cases to build container images, then Builder is, an, is a good choice to use as a low-level tool um, to basically achieve it and not worry about the rest. Um, right, at the, at the moment, uh, the team is working, especially the, the Builder folks, obviously, are working on uh, making or using Builder in OpenShift for the build pipeline uh, rather than Docker. And also there's a lot of work going on with Ansible containers and um, uh, right um, later in the talk, Dan and I will talk about how the team uh, makes it possible to use Builder in the OpenShift uh, Kubernetes pipeline specifically. So usually what uh, when using Docker and when people want to build containers inside containers. So when you, when you have a building pipeline on, on Kubernetes, necessarily all your workloads are running in a pod, so in a container or a container in a pod. Um, and it, if you start Docker there, you will have a new Docker daemon. If you want to pull something down, everything needs to be started again. And most likely you won't have the privileges. Um, so uh, a, a common approach to allow it is Docker in Docker. So you mount the Docker socket into the container, install the Docker client, and then you can conveniently use Docker inside there. But this, this works well, but it comes at a cost, and especially at a security cost. And using Builder, so because the security cost is because you have basically access to a socket on the host, and the con which effectively gives you ex root access on the host. Uh, and this is a bad thing. Um, not necessarily when you know your workloads, when you trust the workloads, but when you want to execute random Docker builds, or when you're afraid of corruption, then you cannot trust basically this, uh, this architecture. Builder works differently. As I said, it's not a daemon. So there's no need to talk to the Docker socket and it's especially not leaked. The problem with, or a security issue is basically information and data from the host leak into the container. So there's always a door open. Some people say, well, it's always with containers, but this is specifically, right? There you know this is a way how I can access the host. I can exploit this. So Builder can also run as a non-root on, on the desktop, I think also on the server, um, at just as Podman. The architecture is very similar. Um, the containers are a, a look a little bit different because for building a container, or building a container looks a little bit different. You have different requirements also with respect to the capabilities and things like this um, than for running them in production, such as with Podman. And, well, I've said this before. We can uh, use or mount the rootfs on the host and then just install it there, the package is there. Um, I was talking about this already before, so traditionally um, people leak the Docker daemon, the socket uh, specifically, into the container. So then in the container, in a Kubernetes pipeline, uh, you can execute it. And this was a very bad idea from a security perspective. And Dan wrote an article a couple of years ago about how granting unprivileged users access to the Docker socket is the most dangerous thing you do on a link system. So you can basically, or you have a root without the password. Um, so you can, you can do a lot of nasty things. Um, the bottom line there is if you give me access to the Docker socket, I can become full root on your system and cause harm. And then 
as I'm root, I can basically erase all the traces on the host. So I can corrupt data, I can do very nasty things and then clean up afterwards and then the folks on the other side are left alone figuring out what has happened and most likely they will not find out. Um, right, so Builder is targeting also this use case. Uh, building container images in the pipeline and conveniently if you want to use it into, uh, in a Kubernetes pipeline it would be nice to have pre-built images that you can use. And here we have uh, some on Quay. This is basically uh, where you can, can find it on Quay.io repository builder. You can download it. We offer it in, in three different flavors. So builder is pre-installed on this image. You don't need to create your own images. This is something that we maintain uh, officially from upstream. Um, so there's a stable one which uses Fedora, uh, the stable Fedora release and also the latest stable version of uh, Portman. Then there's a testing one um, with updates from testing if they exist and then an, an upstream one which basically uses the latest uh, master. So it's head, it's the bleeding edge. Obviously there can, there can be bugs introduced, so if you use it in production. I highly recommend using using the, the stable one. If you're curious uh, about the latest one or want to play with the latest version, use the upstream one. Uh, I'm not sure how often it gets propagated, but I'm certain it's at least once per day. So currently we use the, uh, if, if we look at the images at the stable docker file that we use to generate the builder image on quay.io. Currently we use the latest Fedora release for updating the container images, but in the future we could also use the universal base image from Red Hat for instance if uh, customers want, want to build on it uh, or if the community wants to build on it. So there are thoughts to also uh, offer it with UBI images. So here, the from, then we, in, now we install builder, we also install fuse overlays, uh, FS. So why fuse overlay? We want to run the containers without root inside the container, um, which means we cannot use natively uh, overlay because the overlay file system requires us to have the CAPSIS admin capability, which effectively can be more or less compared to having root. So still we want to use the mechanisms of overlay and the concept of layering file systems. So uh, Giuseppe Scrivano, a colleague uh, from, from the team, wrote Fuse Overlay FS, which is basically uh, overlay implementation in user space which runs in user space and which uses fuse and right we remove the container as e linux here to keep the the image really 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 small and after that we do the typical cleanup we remove the cache uh, the locks of dnf and yum to Get, get rid of all the traces that uh, or, and metadata that we don't need. Uh, so we really need to keep it uh, small. So in the third step in the Stalker file, we are configuring container storage, which is used by Builder, Potman, Scopio, uh, and also Cryo. And specifically here, we use it to use Fuse Overlay FS. So if you see the first SED um, command, we're uncommenting the mount program which basically tells or instructs the container storage backend to use this mount program, which is then pointing to, or by default, to Fuse Overlay FS. So then Fuse Overlay FS is used for mounting. We also set the uh, additional image stores um, to uh, var lib shared. So the additional image stores. Usually when we run Builder, Portman, yada yada, there is one central storage for image, for images. And um, sometimes it's nice or maybe 
what additional images does is it allows for also looking up in other paths and other stores searching for the image, which is a nice use case, for instance, if you have a shared environment, maybe an HPC, um, you want things to be fast, you don't want users to uh, consume a lot of disk storage, you want uh, to avoid redundancy, you may have a shared network storage, you can use additional image stores and point it to the shared network storage, and then users can uh, can use uh, the images there directly. So when you do a potman or build a pull, it will first look into the image stores, see if the image is there. If it's there, it will use it. Um, otherwise, it will, oops, it will contact uh, and ask the registry for pulling. And in the last uh, step, we're, we're just adding some, uh, some files that otherwise Builder will add at runtime to tweak a little bit more performance, right? We can save a few cycles by adding the log files, for instance. So the, the log files that you see here are used to synchronize processes to avoid data corruption. So if, we are, if you have multiple builder processes running in parallel, all talking to the store, um, they need to be serialized at some point to avoid data corruption. They could be reading, writing at the same paths um, simultaneously. We can't use mutis, mutixes and semaphores because we don't share the same memory space, um, uh, process space, so we have, have to defer uh, those things to, to file logs. And last but not least, um, we need to set the builder started in user uh, and as environment variable and set also the builder isolation crude. So if builder detects that it's being run without Capsys admin, it will attempt to set a user namespace as part of setting itself up to run its uh, rootless mode, um, uh, which, which is just its behavior when it runs without uh, Capsys admin, uh, because we need to create a new or unshare from the current user namespace to get a little bit more privileges out of it. And setting this environment variable stops it from attempting to do it. Um, because we're already running in a container, so we don't need to, we don't need to uh, do it. And um, we also tell Builder to set it to the crude-based isolation rather than full namespace isolation. Well, uh, again, we're already running into a container. We're already in a locked-down environment, and running as crude makes it a little bit less redundant, and also we tweak a little bit more performance. So this is a, a, a really nice way of doing it. Some of you will uh, understandably ask, how can I possibly know about this? Well, there are some technical details, um, or many technical details. And this is first why we're talking about it and also why we're officially supporting this image so users don't have to worry about that. So. As I mentioned in the introduction of this talk, um, basically we have an optimization problem. Security versus speed. It will haunt us forever in IT. And yeah, the speed that a process can run versus amount of security we can wrap processes with. So for instance, in a, in a recent report, I read that depending on where the container is being executed using SECOM filters, uh, can decrease performance by up to 10%, depending on where you run on. Why? Because the SECOM filters are really big, right? Traditionally, if or if you were in the the in the last talk, I said that traditionally container engines use a whitelist approach, so the filters get really really big. So we enable I don't know uh, 300 syscalls or 180 syscalls for each syscall. The kernel has to go through the list and check. Oh, am I allowed to do it? 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 And so on. This this comes at a cost. So security comes at a cost. And in this talk, Dan explains how we can find the right balance when using Builder. So we designed the the Builder image to allow users also to to experiment with a correct mix of them depending on what they need. Later, I'm going to show some. 
some code examples and also a demo that Dan recorded um, yesterday uh, to show how users can use it to, and to fit it to their specific needs. So certainly the totally locked down case is the slowest one. We have as much isolation as the kernel can get us, nearly as much, and uh, a lot of resource restrictions. So we don't have access to uh, the mount points of the host, we don't see the PIT namespace, we have a different network namespace, uh, all, all these things. So now we use Podman to execute this image. Right, but we could have just as easily used Docker or Cryo in Kubernetes. Um, here we need to mount uh, dev fuse because well, overlay of as is a fuse implementation and needs fuse to be present. This is the builder image that we're using, Quai.io repository builder. It will automatically pick the latest, so which is the pointing to stable. Uh, here we mount the Docker file. <coughs> Sorry, the Docker file that I was showing before, and we're running on a SE Linux enabled uh, system, so we need to pass the option colon set um, to instruct relabeling. If not, SE Linux, uh, SE Linux will tell us, ah, no, my friend, you're not going to read that. Um, and then we're going to build the test image. Again, build a bot, short version, we're lazy for uh, build using Dockerfile. Um, so uh, the container starts with, yeah, basically everything is empty. The container storage is empty because there's nothing, we clean everything up from the base image. Um, all the DNF caches are cold, there's no metadata, all the files have to be created. This, this takes a little bit of time, it makes it slow. However, it's, it's most secure. It's totally locked down, uh, although it's running uh, as root inside the container. Um, this would work uh, within a user namespace, and it's totally isolated from the, ho from the host. Necessarily, this is the, the most secure option that we're having. There's no information leak. Um, however, if we, there, there's no sharing. If we have no leak to the host, the containers and the host cannot share anything. So when you have all images on this planet on your host and you know, well, I have it on the host, you will redundantly store the data there and it will make the build slower. Yet, we chose or optimized for security, and this is the cost that we have to pay. Um, I'm not going to start the demo now. I'm not a cowboy as Dan is, but I'm going to show his, his demo later. So, the totally, so, no, sorry for the hiccup. Right, I mean, totally privileged is, uh, is the fastest one. We can share everything with a host. It's basically just a, a, a glorified process uh, that happens to have another root of S, and we use Builder from there. So again, we have the same command as before, but now we're going to mount varlib containers, which contains, um, sorry, the, the images um, that are already pulled down. So, this means that if we pull down an image once, we don't need to pull it down another time. It will be shared uh, with the host and all containers that are also mounting or volume mounting varlib containers. Um, to make this less of a pain, we disable SE Linux, and I'm pretty sure Dan will, will talk a lot about that this is not a good idea but it really just depends on the use case. If we know that no bad things will happen because we trust the builds that or the images that we're going to build, uh, then this is a fine thing. So, right, here it's the fastest and it can, since everything can be shared on the host, in the containers, and other container engines also 
Scopio, build an apartment and so on, they can, can instantly use the new images from the store. However, it's the least secure. Since the container storage is shared, yeah, we can, we can write content that would affect other containers in the future. We could also just remove things and maybe break uh, running workloads at the moment. If container A is downloading an image and uh, malicious container B is detecting that a new image is there, it might just remove it. And then if container A wants to run another container in the container referencing the image that has just been deleted, well, this is, this is not going to work, um, at least not in all circumstances. And disabling SE Linux, well, I mentioned it before, Dan, Dan really does not, does not like disabling this, uh, SE Linux and it's one of the most important security mechanisms um, on SE Linux enabled systems. It has prevented a lot of CVEs and security issues in the past and it will prevent them in the future. In some cases, SE Linux even prevented um, kernel CVEs because, I mean, we cannot exploit a, the, a, a kernel bug if we're not allowed to execute. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of good, good, good things and wisdom in using SE Linux. Still, it's more secure than Docker and because it can only, we only write to the container host. So, uh, right, we're volume mounting varlib containers and not a socket that uh, allows for root execution on the entire host. Demo I will, I will show later. I'm not as a cowboy as Dan is. So now we're, we're trying to find a middle ground. Uh, we don't want, well we want to speed up things because maybe we, uh, well, we want to have things fast and maybe sharing things read-only is acceptable. Well, if I cannot write to it and the kernel makes sure I'm not able to, to corrupt any data but just consume it, this is something that may be acceptable. Maybe not for every user in all, all circumstances, but for some. And now we're writing here varlib container storage, uh, storage as read-only and put it to varlib shared. If you remember, we configured our builder in the container image in the Docker file to set the additional stores to varlib shared. And what we're doing here effectively is mounting the storage, the image store or container store from the host, everything that's inside there to the additional store in the container. So when in the container builder is pulling an image that is being used during a build, it will look up in the additional store, see it's there, use the data there, and it will have quite some, uh, quite some performance improvement. Right, it's obvious, we don't need to, uh, to download um, hundreds of megabytes, but we just access it that's already on disk. All right, basically I set everything that is here and it's also very secure because we're, we're still totally locked, locked down. Still, it, the image inside is running as root. Uh, well, we can use username spaces, but this would not work within a username space. Most isolate, yeah, and it's most isolated from the host. Only information leak images from the host. So what we need to be careful of is Although we cannot write, but if you're storing confidential data on the host image store, then you shouldn't do it because the containers have access to it. They can read it. So if you have a secret, don't put it there. Demo I'm going to show later. And now Dan wants to talk about some more advanced use of the additional stores. So. One question is when it comes to uh, improving per the performance of Builder in such a Kubernetes OpenShift environment is why are we pulling potentially huge images to every container node, right? We can, I mean, we're in a distributed system. We have that, we then have distributed problems, which 
in many cases are the same we have on the host across processes, but now we just uh, somehow lift it to yet another level, which then spans across machines. Uh, one example, right, is uh, HPC. Uh, high performance computing, those folks, they have really gigantic images and they are running on thousands of nodes, yet they want to avoid redundancy in a very, very locked down environment. So usually you don't get, or in nearly all circumstances, you won't have root access on any node you have in HPC. This is why many HPC targeted container engines are uh, from the security perspective, well, not well, there's barely any security because uh, most are crudeing or just use uh, crude or ch root depending on how you want to uh, want to pronounce it. So um, for HPC or for this specific use case, we can put additional stores on on a shared network storage, right? It could be N NFS, then there's uh, Ceph. S3, iSCSI, all, all the, the things that are out there, we can use it. Additional image stores, the admins decide what's there, and you can use it. And the nice thing is all uh, container tools that we're building, they're, they all share the same building blocks. So Lipod, Podman, for instance, uses code directly from Builder uh, it has a dependency on builder pack go packages from builder that it's using for uh, the docker file builds same goes down to the image library and the storage library so all of the tools instantly ha benefit from it so this is a really nice things um, shortcomings with this approach is well there could be potential problems with network latency and hiccups so this is somehow also a little bit a shift of the responsibility, but we're not to blame anymore, so that's nice, right? Um, and yeah, we so an, an argument to do is to do that is well, we already share network storage in those environments, so we should also do this for images. Again, containers are Linux, and this is just normal data for. Uh, processes that look a little bit different than uh, commonly on your on your system. Another thing uh, we've been looking at at builds is why does DNF or yum take so long to run? Sometimes this is really a bottleneck during build because well, uh, downloading things can can take time, right? So uh, both yum and DNF they uh, need to update their cache. So they have a cache and they look, is the cache still hot or do I need to do I, do I need to update it? And this includes basically information on all RPMs, on all paths used in the entire distribution. And it's apparently it's a very, very big XML file and parsing XML it takes uh, takes also some time. And this can take more than 30 seconds. So if you do a yum yada yada, you can add 30 seconds to to the uh, basically the execution time of the command. So, if we if we look a little bit deeper at the problem, is also the way how most people write Docker files. So here, for instance, we create a new or we base a new image on UBI8. Then we do well, basically what everybody's doing with any package or, uh, package manager on this planet. We install something and then we remove the metadata again. Well, every time, okay, uh, first we remove the metadata because we don't want to have this on our layer, right? We want our images to be small or the layers that we use in our images to be small. So we should only keep data on the container image layer that we really need. For execution, we don't need the metadata. So we remove it. But here we have at least two calls of yum or DNF. So you can add 60 seconds to, to the build time of the image and it's not really necessary. Um, so we were thinking a little bit about how can can we we do this. So uh, we cannot really do it read only. 
So we can't use the trick we've been using before with the read-only image stores because in some cases maybe DNF and YAM want to write there. So then it needs to be writable. And here comes the, the concept of overlay volume mounts. So overlay volume mounts allow you to volume mount into a directory for, from the host into the container. It's writable inside the container, but read only on the host. So the mount point for the container, we can write there. We, are right. we can read the data that is already there on the host, but as soon as we write something, it won't be propagated down to the host. So the data on the host is secure, but we can read it. And right, a newly written content will be uh, destroyed when the container exits, basically. We unmount, we unmount all the junk that we don't need, and we're done. So in, in this case, if we mount the metadata or the caches from the host into the container, awesome. If uh, assuming the cache is hot, then we can just use it. 30 seconds, done. Another yum, done. And if we remove it, we don't care. It won't be written to the host. So this Docker file will still work. If we run uh, the second run DNF, the cache is still hot. Don't need it. And if we only use it, we don't even need to clean afterwards. Or maybe we still want to clean because we don't want to commit it. Um, but it depends really on, on how many or how many paths uh, we mount it inside. How do we do this? We uh, add the colon capital O uh, to the path that we're mounting or the volume mount. And this is basically achieving exactly this. So we have the overlay volume mount, then at var cache DNF that we use from the host. And then talking in overlay terms, right? We have a, a layer overlay file, file system. The host one is on the lower level, uh, on the lower read-only layer, not level, layer, sorry. And the one in the container is an upper layer, which is writable. So this basically uh, does the trick for us. So we're just using overlay concepts to, to achieve it. And, well, demo I'm gonna show, I, still, we, I think we still have 15 minutes, which is awesome. And after that, I guess I need to clear my throat. <clears> throat> Oops. Oh, right, I'm not. Uh, there we go. So I'm not now mirroring. Can you, can you still read it in the back? If not, I would ask you to, to move forward. So, um, Dan Dan said, "Well, I'm I'm going to prepare a demo for you." And I said, "Please don't prepare a demo for me. Things will go south if I run it locally or maybe the network is down." So he said, "Okay, I'm going to record record the demo." Uh so thank you Dan in case you're watching. And now I'm going to show you what's going on. Uh I try to show you what's going on. Ah, right. There, I can go full screen. Wow, this is much better. Oh, nice. Okay, running dance demo. Well, this is a nice demo, isn't it? Okay, it's showing technical issues. I'm gonna scale it back. Okay, maybe it doesn't scale as much as I want to. There you see I'm really a terminal guy, I'm not. Okay, this is as big as we can go apparently. Does it? Well, let's, let's do it like this then. So here we have the three examples, right? We have the totally locked down container, we check how long it will take, then we have the totally privileged container, which also has write access, which we expect to be the fastest. And then we have the middle ground, where we can, uh, 
mount uh, the cache read only. And I think Dan also wants to demonstrate the overlay mount. Right. So now Dan is using the UBI 8, Universal ba Base Image, from RHEL 8 and use it in, uh, in a clean container storage. So here we are now pulling, or we have to pull the image, or the two layers and the image config. So this takes already 17.6 seconds. I think Dan wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm not skipping the 17 seconds. So now we use the totally privileged one. So we mount varlib containers directly into our build container. So, well, okay, well, this is, this is really fast, right? So we spare 14 seconds just by allowing for sharing data. but I'm amazed that Dan actually did this in one run and didn't script it. I'm sure I would have made plenty of typos. Uh. One, one typo, yeah, it's amazing. For me, it would be every second word. So here, this time, it, it was uh, obviously faster. Uh, we we sp were around 40 seconds faster uh, because the image was already there, so we can just reuse it. But we had to disable SE Linux entirely. And in our world, we don't like disabling SE Linux at all for the aforementioned reasons, right? Um, especially the problem is now we can override data in the host, so in the, in the container storage of the host. We don't have access to the host, but to the container storage. So with respect to this data, well, we can corrupt it. So in the, in the, last, in the last example, we use the additional stores. So this is what I was talking on before, where we mount um, the container storage as read-only to the path of the additional stores within the container image, which is build as stable. Right. Okay, now I'm going to put this down. I guess we lost a little bit of things here. Yeah, so we, we volume mount varlib container storage to varlib shared as read only. And varlib shared in the builder stable container image that we use, um, this is configured to be an additional storage. So when Pulling images, Builder will look up into the additional store, detect that the image is already there, and now this is actually faster. Uh, well, it's, it's not a representative benchmark because it has only been executed once and maybe the, if we, there was some scheduling going on or Dan was listening to heavy metal w while doing this and Spotify was downloading at the moment. Um, or writing a lot to the disk. Um, but you can see that with the concept of additional stores and mounting them as read-only, we have a very similar speed, a very similar performance as running in a completely a privileged container. So in, in the end, this optimization problem in this specific context can, can, really, can really be tamed. So we can be secure in the sense that we are not able to corrupt data on the host 
at least we are protected by the kernel because we can trust the kernel or have to trust the kernel that it will be mounted as read only. But we have the same performance as with running completely insecure, privileged, where we could corrupt the data. So Dan, thank you for providing this demo. You saved my life. And I guess I saved yours. So maybe we're even. And that's pretty much for this talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Maybe you want to see more slides? Can you show the demo? You, uh, I want to rerun the demo? Uh, to share it, you mean? Ah, uh, yeah, I will. So I asked Dan uh, to upload the slides on sket.com. So we will make sure that we will upload all all the slides to sket.com. So you can you can have a look, and I will I will ask Dan also to to put a link to to the demo, or it will expire at some point. But what I will do is I will sneak it. There we go. So here you will. Now the link is there for sure. Um, the Askinema here, it might expire at some point, um, although I'm not sure. I will, I will talk to Dan and he will make sure. Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm. So the the question is um, basically the, the the status of sharing data on network storage, right? Um, correct. Well, yeah. Right. Um, well, I'm. I. I don't know of any problems so far. Let's put it this way. I was uh, personally I was not involved into this development. Dan will know for sure. Um, so then, if you're listening, um, but I haven't heard of uh, of any complications so far. So another way to speed things up would be to let the host and the containers uh, use a mirror which is close to them. So it can be a node local registry mirror, where where if you pull from Docker IO or registry Red Hat dot com. Uh, or registry access Red Hat uh, everything will be cached there. This would also speed up things, but we we chose this one this one for now. So long story short, I, I cannot answer your 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 question uh, for sure, but I uh, or with certainty, but I haven't heard of any problems so far. All right, then I think after three hours, I'm going to take a shower now and going to talk to you later. Thanks for joining.